come again on this what did you just say I said I could start again with the story of my socks why don't we do that then so uh, uh, well let me show your socks first as uh, we are entering from that oh it's even better there is no problem with uh, with the socks right no, from a, a, a physical point of view physical point of view the socks are fine mm -hmm. they, were, they were chosen for me by this morning this morning by my granddaughter who has cerebral palsy and she poses oh well this morning she uh, was my fashion guru and advised me on what socks to wear but the joy with working with her is that you have to be spontaneous and creative all the time, which was, mm -hmm. which is what Moreno kept talking about in, in terms of encouraging people that he worked with. And so the delight in working with her is that every day she poses new challenges for you about how to go up. So this morning we were trying to get her into the bath and she wasn't happy to go upstairs. So we had to find a creative way of getting her to walk up the stairs. So I, I appeared half without my shoes and socks on and without a top on. And so it was being able to say, come and help dad, come and help granddad to choose his clothes. And, and so she would come up the stairs. And so the day, so the day started. So to me, in the work that I do at the moment, Helping people to be spontaneous and creative is really important. So mm -hmm. I run two theatre groups for the over 50s at the moment. And one of them is a social improvisation group. We mm -hmm. just make up stories and, have, and basically <coughs> have fun. The other group is more serious and we create all of our own plays. That We start them from the beginning, we do them in rehearse, we, we rehearse them we hot seat different actors and we develop stories that and the stories that we have going at the moment are serious stories about dementia for example which um, which the lo we get commissioned by the local council and local voluntary groups to do and and two of these plays are now going to be translated into urdu and punjabi Mm -hmm. and, we also, and we also have fun plays that we do, plays about, plays for example, about relationships. So for me, this is going back to where Moreno started from, mm -hmm. in the sense that he started as a dramatist before he moved on and became a psychodramatist and a sociodramatist. But what is the name of your, the, 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 the girl? The girl is called Millie. Millie? Millie. How old is she? She's nearly seven. Nearly seven. Yeah. Is it she the only granddaughter that you have? Or? We have six grandchildren between us. Six? Six. Mm -hmm. but, so we see a lot of her and her brother who is ten. And then we have two grandchildren who live in London, who we see, who are ten and twelve. And then we have two older grandchildren. Who are, who are in their twenties and grown up now? Mm -hmm. And we, we, when you were mentioning what you are doing with the, the, these people over sixty, where is that? One group is in a city called Leeds, and another group is in a city called Huddersfield. They're both in West. They're both in the part of England which is called West Yorkshire. Mm -hmm. I have the impression that your name is very closely uh, related to social drama when we talk about uh, important people doing social drama in, in this planet. Why is that? I think because, well, I think for a number of reasons that my, before I came into social drama, I was very much a community activist. So I was concerned with issues about communities, community development, I worked in Northern Ireland 
during the difficult mm -hmm. time of, the, of um, the troubles there. And then I ended up running a managing a, a psychiatric day centre. Mm -hmm. And from running the psychiatric, as part of running the psychiatric day centre, I got into psychodrama. And then I met Ken Sprague who became my social drama trainer and Ken was a very larger than life character but what social drama managed to do was to bring the two bits if you like of together so you brought the personal together but you put the personal in some wider societal context mm -hmm. at the same time so any story that is happening on an individual basis is a story which in some way <coughs> reflects the culture and the society within which that story is being told. Mm -hmm. And so I, so to me, sort of psychodrama and sociodrama are not two separate entities, they're part of the same continuation. And so that, so that for sociodrama to work, it also often has to touch into something personal, but actually for people to, sometimes to understand the, um, psychodrama, it's quite important to understand why this particular problem is happening for this individual and other individuals like them at this particular time of societal change. Mm -hmm. Well, when you do a, uh, when you direct a, a social drama, uh, do you do you do it like this as you are now seated uh, or yeah. no uh, uh, no so. I would like us to have a look at uh, the, the stage that we have in front of us. Well, well where are we, first of all? We're in, uh, in Halifax Hall in uh, Sheffield in West Yorkshire, where at the BPA Annual Con British Psychodrama Association Annual Conference. In 2000... 2017. In 17. Yeah. Uh, basically, today we are... Uh, the se it's the 7th of July. Yes. 2017. Yes. And here we are. We don't have the traditional empty chair, uh, which leads... Uh, s most of the times to social drama, but we have a number of empty chairs. And also, we also have a lot of glasses on the table. Mm -hmm. so, in, so, in a sense, it, uh, so if, if uh, this box of tissues was, mm -hmm. was, uh, was in this, well, I mean, it depends because sometimes you're doing a person-centered social drama which starts with an individual but, but finds a way of becoming a group story. Sometimes you're working with a, with a whole group and the whole group begins to develop the, sto develop the story so it becomes a sort of a collective story owned by the whole of the group from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So it depends which way you start. But I, if I think Social dramatically, I'm always thinking about the, who are the stakeholders in this story, in a sense. What are the what are the different roles, and then what's the relationship? What's the system, if you like, which connects the different stakeholders together, and how and and how come that this particular, if you like, system has come into existence. And then you're beginning to work with the group to gain some under by using role reversal, for example, so that people begin to understand the story from as many different perspectives as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're, you're looking, first of all, for understanding, and then you're looking for, once we have some understanding, how do we go about changing it? Where, where within the system is there movement that we can begin producing some change. Mm -hmm. Now, Ron, uh, the thing is that uh, we have people who want to do some social drama to uh, go ahead and uh, not to take just the habit of doing psychodrama all the time, but some people 
because social drama is not that popular as psychodrama is. I'm not saying that uh, psychodrama is very popular, but if you compare the two methods, uh, uh, by far, psychodrama is more popular. So many people would like to do social drama, but they don't know how. So let's assume, let's the as if you have a group here. Yeah. So you have a group of people, um, and um, how do you start uh, with this group? First of all, by not having a table in the middle of the group. Mm -hmm. okay. well, what is the problem of the table in the middle of the group? Because it inhibits movement at the moment. Uh -huh. so, but just as in psychodrama, you'd start by doing a warm-up. So you're, you're, what you're doing is you want to warm up people to being here, you want to warm up people to the room, you want to warm up people to the group, and you want to begin warming up people to the topic or uh, to, the co to whatever the story is today that the group's going to explore. Mm -hmm. So if you're actually um, being employed, for example, to come in and use sociodrama to help a uh, staff team in an organisation to work, then in some senses the task is given to you from the beginning because it's the group saying we'd like to understand better how we work and how we can change to improve it. <clears throat> Sometimes you just have a collection of people who've come because it, of interest in sociodrama and then, and then you, you need to find a way of perhaps by sociometric choice by people in smaller groups coming together um, to find what, what is the story which uh, that um, people would like in the group would like to explore today mm -hmm. and then once you once you've done that you then need to find a scene a if you're a, a scene which serves as a starting point from which you can expand the story but sometimes if I'm working I like to in, in my original training it was almost very much like you had one scene and then you finish that and you move to another scene and you finish that and you move to another scene but often I like um, I think the, inspired a bit by the work of Moises Aguirre from South America is, is that all the stories already exist within the group and that you can start anywhere you can take two people and this is often the work we do in the, um, the, the theatre groups I work with is you just get two people to start telling a story and whatever story they're telling is in some way a story which belongs to the group at this time and if it's um, a manager, for example, if it's a manager and a worker starting a scene then immediately you can begin thinking of ways to expand it because you can have the worker's family situation that comes into it which you've got the manager's background You've got the story of um, the company and the pressure from outside forces. So if there's a particular problem that exists in the story that starts between a manager and a worker, mm -hmm. you can then begin expanding the story to gain some understanding of why this particular story exists at this time. And as people get warmed up while you're doing this, people begin volunteering for roles. Mm -hmm. And so... And, and, and so, and so, the story that will emerge will will be a story <coughs> which, in some way, belongs to what it is that the group on this particular day at this particular time would like to explore. Uh -huh. But when once you have the story yeah. and the the let's say the script, it's not the script, yeah. but the the the, the story uh, chosen. Uh, and this, the action takes place, what is your style uh, uh, as a director? Are you someone who intervenes, stays uh, uh, close to the scene, you take some distance, what, what do you prefer? How do you I, direct? I, well, I think the secret in, in some way of directing is that you have to have two things going on in your brain at the same time. So on one hand, you have to be 
you have to be thinking cognitively, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. uh, but there's another bit about you, which almost like your brain needs to be empty enough that you can actually hear the, the stories and the emotions as they emerge in the group. The difference in between, psycho, one difference between psychodrama and sociodrama is that in psychodrama, there is just one story primarily, which is the protagonist's story. So it's a little bit like um, uh, railway lines. It's fairly direct. You're, as the director, you're following. Mm -hmm. In sociodrama, um, you, you have to listen to all of the stories which might exist in a group. So it's much more like uh, a motorway or an autobahn where you come to a roundabout and you, and because there are more than one stories always present, you then have to decide which story or which, which path you're going to take off the roundabout. Okay. And so you do, there are, if I remember, four criteria. One is, what is the contract? Um, the second one, what is the logic of the story? Mm -hmm. The third one is, where is the group energy? And the fourth one is, the director's intuition. There. So for me, I think my it also depends where I'm working. So if I'm working abroad um, in a language which isn't mine, I'm looking for a way to enable the group to work as much as possible in their own language with minimal interventions from myself. Because I think this, if people are working in their first language, it works better. And so I'm. So I'm, what I'm trying to do then, I have a, obviously a bit of an input from uh, an interpreter there, but I'm just trying to understand what's actually happening without having to be told mm -hmm. a little bit of what's happening. But if, if I'm working in my own language with a group, um, with a group then I think my style will vary. Um, so sometimes it's quite laid back, sometimes it's much more interventionist, Sometimes you have a quick insight and you think, oh, if I do this, this, here, that will move things forward very quickly. So mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I wouldn't say that I have one particular style in the way that I work. Yeah. So now, coming back to the uh, empty chair technique from a social dramatic point of view, I wonder if uh, we had in, in the history of uh, psychodrama and social drama, so many empty chairs united and they are not reacting at all up to now um, but the the table is still here what I'd like to know from you is when you have this type of uh, thing it's a huge table yeah. it's a heavy one how far you go to the change of the situation are you um, open to move or try to move the chair, the, the, the table, or you move people from the place? What would be your... Uh, it, might, it, would, it would depend on what I felt was possible in the group. So I might, for example, ask people to take a shoe off. Mm-hmm. And to put the shoe on the table, as, which represents them. And then I might begin saying, so we might begin to do some sociometric mapping. Oh, where, where's your shoe closest to? Um, we, I could have taken some books off the bookcase. Yeah. We could have used those to begin sculpting a story, for example. Mm -hmm. So uh, we could have begun. Um, we could have said, this is a boardroom meeting. It depends what the group is, but it could have been, um, if this was, who do you, yeah, we could begin doing some sort of family sculpting. If this was a family dinner table, who in this group would sit at the top of the table? Mm -hmm. would, who are the children in this group? Where would they be? So, so I think, yeah. so it's part of um, being able to maintain one's own um, spontaneity as, as the story develops. And also it's obviously important to keep moving because th there's a mirroring effect. If the group gets stuck, then very often yeah, one finds oneself as the director stuck. 
Mm -hmm. So actually physical, physically moving helps. And also as you move and you begin seeing the story from different perspectives, which then opens up the possibility for actually seeing where role reversals, for example, mm -hmm. might happen. Yeah, uh, look, I've been in touch for more than six years already with Monica Zuretti, mm. the, the yeah. Argentinian yeah. Um, psychodram social psychodramatist, yeah. I would say, yeah. as she would prefer. Um, and uh, having seen and having participated in some uh, psychodramas, yeah. Um, she directs with some other uh, people from the team. She frequently um, moves from social drama to psychodrama in the same session, in the same activity, so that uh, uh, you can combine the individual approach of the theme with the collective approach of that uh, so it's a way of handling yeah. how do you um, react to that are is this mixing uh, psychodrama and social drama in your practice is it something that it's frequent or not how do you handle that okay. i think I th a lot of it has to do with your contract with the group in the first place. So, so if you're going to move, if you're going to combine the, the two modalities, if you like, mm -hmm. then, then the contract with the group has to be that this is, that this is actually going to happen. So, that, so, that, so in a lot of the groups that I work with, that isn't necessarily part of the contract to do that. But there are other occasions when you're working with a group which is more open, where I have done a, not, not a full psychodrama within the middle of a sociodrama, but I've done a vignette. Because you can, so you can see somebody's very warmed up, mm -hmm. but, but also what they're... So you, if somebody's very warmed up, you obviously have a choice if you're working. So it might be that if you think that it's not appropriate to work psychodramatically, you can role reverse them out of the the role that they're in at the moment to um, a, a different role. But if you've got permission within the contract with the group to be able to work more psych psychodramatically, it's, then it's, I think, for me, on occasions, it's possible to do a vignette. Uh -huh. And I wouldn't say that's my normal, normal way of working, but it's something I, I do on occasions. Okay, look, I, uh, as you are talking, uh, I'm feeling that my right arm is quite tired already yes. because I'm holding the camera. So I would suggest that we stop for a while yeah. as I will change the, the way uh, the camera is taken. Is it okay? Fine with me. Okay.